Brian Winhorst is joining us once again here from the Worldwide Leader in Sports on the Rich Eisen Show with the Cavs getting a big win last night. Kyrie Irving, uh, as good as he's ever been, coming off the campus of Duke with 42 points to get playoff career high. Brian Winhorst joining us on the show. How are you, Brian? Okay, Rich, how are you? Okay, so what what happened to make Game 4 different from Game 3, in your estimation? Well, first off, we saw for the first time in 1,300 career games, LeBron had four fouls in the first half. Um, that was certainly interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think you'll see that again in his career. I would bet on it, actually. Um, and what you really saw was Kyrie Irving uh, grabbing the reins. Um, you know, if you look at the numbers and the results on the scoreboard, uh, the Cavs have been a frankly terrible team when LeBron hasn't played, either when he's missed games or a lot of times when he's uh, been on the bench. They've been highly negative on the scoreboard. And so when LeBron left the game and the Cavs down 10 with seven minutes to go in the first half, it was reasonable to believe that they were in big trouble. Uh, and so because of that, I think it was probably Kyrie Irving's uh, best game of his career. Now, he's had a couple of games where he scored in the 50-point range, and that's been breathtaking and impressive. But none of those were playoff games where LeBron was um, sidelined, um, where you, you, lost the, you had the danger of losing home court advantage. And people are going to remember him scoring uh, 21 points in the third quarter where he made nine of 10 shots and threw in some ridiculous shots off the backboard at impossible angles with ridiculous spin. But to me, the fact that he scored 12 points in the last six minutes of the first half when LeBron was sitting there and kept the score at 10 points, um, didn't allow the score to budge was really the, the great accomplishment. And it allowed the Cavs to get their feet underneath them. LeBron had a huge second half and they win. And, Kevin Love had a great game too, and this is you know some of the best basketball we've seen. This three three guys play together. Even in the finals last year, Love got a concussion and missed a game and was not himself. These three guys scored 93 points together last night, and this is the kind of stuff that they dreamed of when they put this group together uh, three years ago. Yeah, and Corver made some plays, and um, you know, um, Sarah, so did Darren Williams. He made some plays and. The question is, uh, Brian, um, what about Love wincing at, towards the end of the game and Kyrie with that ankle? And I understand even even if this thing does go six games, they'd still have about a week off before having to travel out to uh, Golden State to start the finals. Is there anything to be concerned about long term for these guys over the next few weeks? Well, um, here's my medical approach. I looked at Kyrie's ankle last night, and it wasn't swollen. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, he got his, he got his normal treatment after the game. He you know he was able to stay in and play. He speculated that um, you know that it would be sore today, and maybe it'll have an effect tomorrow. Um, he he didn't even know what it was going to be until he woke up. Um, but um, you know, it, it's not a debilitating injury that would keep him out games and games and games. That's the thing. Uh, Kevin Love went through his normal post game. Uh, routine last night. Um, he has intermittent back issues he's had for years now. Um, there was nothing, anything special, but um, you know, you just got to keep an eye on it. But I do think the Cavs have impetus, Rich, to finish the series tomorrow night. Um, the Warriors are resting. Last year, thing people forget, um, the Warriors played a grueling seven-game series with the with the Thunder going into the finals, and the Cavs had a couple of extra days of rest. And I felt like that conference final series caught up with the Warriors at the end. Those last couple of games, I felt the Cavs looked fresher. Well, the Warriors are going to have the rest advantage on the Cavs this time around. And the difference between winning tomorrow and winning on Saturday is the difference between maybe getting a day or two off to totally rest before you start practicing ahead of the finals. You're listening and watching Brian Winhorst uh, and the Honda Insider Report from ESPN right here on the Rich Eisen Show. Then I guess let's front load the conversation uh, who who guards Durant? How does this matchup go down when we all finally get to see it as we expect? Yeah, that's that's the big gigantic difference between this year and last year, Durant, right? I mean, sort of obvious. But last year, the Cavs were able to sort of hide LeBron on uh, Iguodala or Harrison Barnes, and it wasn't because they didn't 
need him. It, 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 it freed him up to be more of a free safety. They just didn't guard those dudes and let him shoot. And then LeBron was able to make plays elsewhere. Um, you can't do that against the Warriors now. They are the most dynamic offensive team probably in league history. Although having said that, the Cavs have actually been better offensively in the playoffs than the Warriors have, if you can believe that. Um, and these first few rounds, um, there's been a lot of times where the Cavs have focused on the opposing team stars, Paul George, DeMar DeRozan, um, Isaiah Thomas for the early part of this series, and the ball gets swung out of their hands and it ends up in the hands of these second and third level role players on the backside, and they've been missing. Um, you know, the C.J. Miles, Monte Ellis, Miles Turners of the world in, in round one, you know, Norman Powell and Patrick Patterson and, and, uh, and, and Serge Ibaka in round two, and then you know, even in this round, the Celtics have been better shooting the, shooting the, those open shots, but still not great. Next round, the ball gets rotated around. It's going to a guy who might be going to the Hall of Fame. And uh, even JaVale McGee, uh, you make three passes and you can give JaVale McGee a dunk. He will penalize you if you don't guard him. So it's going to be an extraordinary challenge for the Cavs defensively in the next round. Um, the biggest challenge the, that this team's ever had. Brian Windhorst of ESPN here on the Rich Eisen Show. And then let the other uh, front-loaded questions about the NBA Finals, let's leave the LeBron legacy question aside. We're going to have a lot of time to chew on that one. What about the idea that these two teams uh, get into the Finals and we all expected it to happen, and it did happen? Uh, does the NBA have any hand-wringing over this? The ratings will be through the roof, so will the interest. But what about the other 28 teams that don't even appear to be in the same uh, generation, even though we did see Kawhi when he was healthy, give uh, the Warriors a run for their money for a half. Yeah, it's an issue. I mean, um, the NBA really tried to fix um, competitive balance with this last CBA. And it just, for various reasons, they couldn't have predicted. And situations like, you know, when they signed Steph Curry to an $11 million a year contract, they didn't realize he was going to become a two-time MVP. You know, just certain circumstances happened they couldn't for, uh, foreseen that submarined it a little bit, and um, it's they try they're trying to fix it in the next CBA, but these things are glacial; they take time. Now, m the counterpoint is here is that the NBA has always been a top-heavy league. That if you look at decade by decade, there's always been two or three teams that have generally dominated over three or four years. What's disappointing this year is the conference finals are supposed to be. A, a, a you know a crowning achievement they, they, they are supposed to be major fights and last year in the east we saw it go six games in the west we saw it go seven um that was you know much closer to what we wanted and the, the the round before we saw a great series between the thunder and the spurs that's the way the league is supposed to be arranged maybe that you would never have 15 teams have a chance to win but you may have six and four of them reach the end and it becomes a hell of a fight that's what's disappointing is that we only have two and you could bring up 15 different people who know the league very well and they give you 15 different reasons how it could be changed or been avoided or whatever. The situation is the situation. The league is trying to take action on it. Whether it works or not, we'll have to see. What I will say is this. The Warriors face some choices with their roster. They have a majority of their roster is going to be a free agent this summer. They're probably going to keep Curry and Durant, which is all that matters. But they're going to have troubles keeping this team together. And the Cavs next year are going to hit the repeater tax, where they're going to be the most taxed team in the history of the league. They're going to have trouble keeping the team together. So there are mechanisms in place trying to correct it. It doesn't mean it'll get corrected, though. A couple more minutes with Brian Windhorst from ESPN. What do you think the Celtics are thinking, looking out there, what's happened in this series, and with uh, Isaiah Thomas's future needing to be contractually solidified in the next two years, and then the number one overall selection? How do you think Danny Ainge is putting all those pieces together? I think the Celtics have beautifully overachieved to this point because from a talent standpoint, they are not in the same league as the Cavs. But from a hustling standpoint, from a scrappiness standpoint, from an execution standpoint, coaching standpoint, they are at the top of the league. And they are to be applauded for what they have been able to squeeze out of this team. Um, uh, they are going to draft Markel Fultz. Now, they're going to mess around and not let everybody know that and take calls and, and obfuscate and hedge and leak stuff up until the draft. But they're going to take Markel Fultz. And the reason they're going to do that is because they don't know about Isaiah Thomas. Is the correct answer to sign Isaiah Thomas to a huge contract and leave him as your franchise player? 
is the correct answer to make Markel Fultz your franchise point guard and take Isaiah Thomas and maybe add the Brooklyn pick um, into uh, a trade and trade for another uh, potentially important player? Will they be able to use their salary cap space this summer to sign Gordon Hayward, or will they be able to you know, steal some other player? These are things that they don't know. They don't have their answers on it yet, and I'm sure they have several different tracks they're going to go down and we'll have to see over the next year. They have the most upwardly mobile team in the NBA, um, and that is, that is a, a compliment to, to Danny Ainge, but they are not yet – a team that can compete with the best teams in terms of talent. Last one. And that's f- something that's been shown. Okay, thank you, Brian. That's a great take right there. Last one for you. I've got Ennis Cantor coming up in hour number two. Any idea if the NBA had anything, uh, any hand in, in getting him out of Romania and getting him to the U.K. on the way to the United States? From what I understand, his greatest asset in this whole thing was the fact that he had a green card. Um, and that was really what greased the skids to, to let him come back in. If he didn't have a green card, it would have been a lot difficult. And I don't understand the complexities. I'm uh-huh. sure uh, Inez would be able to explain to you a lot better than what I have. He's very fortunate that he had it. But this is a problem with the current things that are happening with uh, choices in our government. There's teams that are, that, you know, teams have to go to Toronto every year. There are many, many players who are from Muslim based countries where this is going to be an issue going forward. One of the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, Thon Maker is of Sudanese descent, and if the travel ban had gotten through uh, and not been struck down by the courts, I don't know if he could have gone to t- Toronto and been able to come back into the country. This is a this is a, a flashpoint that the league, especially the NBA, is going to have to to deal with. It's a much smaller piece of what's going on in our country right now. Brian, thanks for the time. We'll have you back on during the finals. Love chatting with you. Thank you, Rich. You Bye-bye. got that's Brian Winhorst at Winhorst ESPN on Twitter. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on radio stations across the country and audience. If you like that, please download our app. There's lots of fun things there other than just more of the videos you just saw. You can call us from the app. You can email us from the app. Just download it. Trust me, you'll enjoy it.